Good morning, church. Welcome to Changi Baptist Church online service. Uh, once again, I'm blessed to be back serving as worship leader after a long time. So, uh, to, to start worship, let me read from Psalms 66, verses 1 to 4. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Let us sing praise to his name with our first song, Shout to the Lord.
our Lord and Heavenly Father, we worship you. We thank you that as our Father, you care about what happens to us. You provide for us, teach us, plan our future, supply all our needs, and you love us. Lord, it is amazing that you love us, even though we have done nothing to deserve it. O oh Lord, your loving kindness is better than life, and our lips will praise you. Thank you, Lord, for always willing to forgive us. Thank you for convicting us of our sins so that we can come humbly before you and confess them. Thank you that no matter how far we stray from your ways, you will always receive us back when we repent and cry out to you for forgiveness. Forgive us for our sins today. Remind us whenever we stray from your laws so that we can confess and repent and receive your forgiveness. Cleanse us of that which is not of you. We bring before you the concerns of the COVID-19 pandemic. Give us the strength to face up the challenge as a unified community. Help us to maintain our focus in the vision of our church, even when we think of this as disruptive. We pray for our government. May our community leaders be wise in the face of the pandemic. We pray for all people, dispossessed, marginalised and alienated. Guard and protect families who are suffering in the face of COVID-19. May we be a people who love God passionately. Share the gospel, care for one another deeply and continue to grow in godly wisdom and willingly serve each other. We pray for our pastors and leaders. May they make prayerful and wise decisions. May there be gospel outcomes with an increase in our church capacity to equip people and give them the zeal to share the gospel with pre-believers. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers, even as we continue to pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from Acts chapter 1 verses 1 to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. 
They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. May God bless the reading of his word.
this morning, our speaker is the Reverend Dr. Graham Ng. Uh, Reverend Graham Ng has been in pastoral ministry for the past more than 30 years. And he has pastored the Presbyterian churches, the Brethren, and even a Baptist church in New Zealand. So he comes to us with a wealth of rich pastoral ministry experiences. Uh, Reverend Graham Ng is also a very gifted uh, expositor of God's Word. Uh, he's a well-known preacher and teacher in our churches here in Singapore and beyond. So it is our privilege this morning to welcome the Reverend Dr. Graham Ng to the pulpit. Good morning, Church. Thank you for the privilege of being able to preach God's Word this morning. The title that I've been given is God's Purpose for the Church, Evangelism. Let's pray together. May the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, Amen. Please keep your Bibles open to Acts chapter 1 as we look at this passage a little bit more closely and to see what we can learn about witnessing or evangelism. What would you think of me if I went around with this bag over my head? <laughs> Pretty ridiculous, right? Yeah, not only would I look silly, I would be restricted because all I can see is the immediate area around my feet. Is it possible that sometimes the local church may be like that as well. The local church uh, sometimes can be fixated upon what is immediate, what is just right in front of them. And uh, they concentrate on their Sunday activities, their ministries, their finances, their buildings, and so on. And they don't lift up their eyes to see the lost, and the needy, they don't look at the word to see what God wants of them in terms of reaching out and building his kingdom. They might even say, we don't have the resources to be witnesses or to evangelize. We have no money, we have no pastors, we have no buildings, no training and so on. Well, you know, the church in Acts also had no money, and no pastor, no building, and no training. But they did have two essentials. One is the Holy Spirit. And secondly, they had a mandate from the Lord Jesus Christ. Both of which we have as well. Let me begin by looking at the prologue in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Luke begins this chapter with a summary of his first volume, that is Luke's Gospel. In verse 1, the second part, it says, All that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. Everything that Jesus did in his earthly ministry, up to the point of his ascension. But then Luke goes on to give special attention to Jesus' resurrection. Look at verse 3. After his suffering, his passion, and his death on the cross, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. During those 40 days, Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of man, not the kingdom of Israel, but the kingdom of God. The emphasis on Jesus' resurrection is important because we have to realize that it's the risen Jesus who is speaking in this chapter. Also, please note that the risen Jesus is giving them his mandate, uh, their marching orders, so to speak, in his final words before he leaves to go back to the Father. So that's the prologue. Secondly, we see the promise, verses 4 and 5. Jesus said, wait 
for the Father's promised gift, verse 4a, which you have heard me speak about. When did Jesus speak about this gift? Well, if we turn in John chapter 14, you see these words, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus was speaking to his disciples here and he says the Spirit will do two things. He will teach and he will remind you of everything that I have said to you. That is one of the most clear functions of the Holy Spirit. It's applicable not only for the disciples in Acts but also to us as well. The Spirit teaches and reminds us. But secondly, there's another passage in John 16 where continuing his teaching about the Spirit, Jesus says, Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin, righteousness and judgment. Here Jesus is referring to the Spirit's ministry to the world as opposed to the earlier passage to his disciples. And the Spirit here, his task is to convict the world of guilt in regard to sin, righteousness and judgment. Now these three very big words. And you know, when you talk to someone about Jesus and you try to talk about sin, really the Holy Spirit has to convict them that they have fallen short of God's standards and they are sinful, they are lost, they are in bondage to sin. We can talk until the cows come home, but we can't really convict someone of their sin unless the Spirit does His work. And it's the same with righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus needs the revelation of the Spirit in the hearts and minds of the non-believers that we speak to. Same with judgment. It's only when the Spirit illuminates people's hearts and minds that they can realize that there is something called judgment that lays ahead, that lies ahead and they need to be prepared for it. So the Spirit is essential for ministry to believers as well as to the world. But Jesus also goes on to say in this passage in Acts 1, wait, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. And of course, he's referring to the day of Pentecost, which is going to happen very shortly. He says in verse 4, do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You have to wait for the Holy Spirit because you need his power in order to do the work of witnessing or evangelism. I once came across this definition of evangelism and I share it with you here. Evangelism is sharing the gospel in the Holy Spirit's power and leaving the results to God. I don't know about you, but when I came across this definition of evangelism, it was very freeing for me. It was very liberating to know that evangelism was not about sitting there and out arguing somebody uh, through the whole night, trying to twist their arms spiritually, so to speak, until they succumbed and they surrendered to Jesus. Far from it. Evangelism is about sharing the gospel in the Holy Spirit's power and leaving the results to God. Who does the sharing? You do, and so do I. We are called to share, that is to communicate the gospel, communicate Jesus to those people who do not yet know him. That's our task, to share. Then, the Holy Spirit is there and present to do the convicting, to help the believers to understand the truth of God's word and to open their hearts and to believe in him. That is the work of the Spirit. The work of conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit, not ours. Our task is to share. And then the last bit says, to leave the results to God. Leave the results to God. That means to say, if you share the gospel with your neighbor, and uh, after hearing you out, your neighbor said, okay, that's very interesting, 
but uh, I'm not quite ready to accept Jesus yet. Uh, or the answer is no, I just can't or I won't at this particular time. According to this definition, would you have done the work of evangelism? I think the answer is yes. Because even though their response may have been a no, you have evangelized simply because you shared the gospel with them, trusting in the Holy Spirit to work, not trusting in yourself. And then you left the results to the Lord. It's between them and God now. right? You've done your part. You leave it to the Lord to do His work, to His timing, and just commit it to the Lord uh, and uh, let Him do what He wants with the situation. So, in evangelism, I have another graphic here which shows the task of evangelism on the right side. Evangelism requires some courage. Yes, that's true. It requires prayer, definitely. Some training is definitely helpful. Uh, and some encouragement from brothers and sisters in Christ. But you know what? The most important thing is that we have the power of the Holy Spirit working. Because if we don't have the Spirit working, if we don't trust in the Spirit, it's still a huge gap. It's still a huge gap. We need the essential working of the Holy Spirit in order to evangelize or to witness. Secondly, that's promise. Thirdly, priority, verses 6 to 8. Jesus said to his disciples, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's interesting that uh, just after this, the disciples, as Jesus was taken up into heaven, they stood there staring into space. And uh, the angels have to sort of, uh, Hey, wake up, wake up! Stop looking up there. The work is down here. Don't look up. Look down at the people and go out and share the gospel with people who are nearby those who need to hear the name of Jesus. It's not about gazing up into the sky and waiting for Jesus to come back. It's not about building earthly kingdoms. It's not about building Israel. It's about building God's spiritual kingdom in ever widening circles. So in this graphic you see the red spot in the center is Jerusalem. That's where the disciples were. Jesus says, Go and be witnesses not only in Jerusalem, but Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, in ever widening circles. And in our context, it would be our hometown, Jerusalem, where we live, where we work. And then our own culture, people in Judea, in the district of Judea. And then a nearby culture. And then further afield to areas where Jesus is not yet known. So in ever widening circles circles of witness is what Jesus wants us to be doing. Warren Wearsby, in his book, uh, in his commentary, he says that witness is a key word. It is used as a noun or a verb 29 times in Acts. And in Acts chapter 4 verse 29, uh, verse 20, excuse me, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. A witness, WSB says, is someone who tells you what he has personally seen or heard. When you are a witness in court, the judge is not interested in your opinions or ideas. He only wants to hear what you have seen and what you know. Our English word martyr comes from the Greek word martyr, translated in Acts 1.8 as witness. Many of God's people have sealed their witness by dying for their faith because of what they knew firsthand of Jesus. In uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 22, you remember that uh, after Judas hanged himself, they had to find a replacement for him. And so they found uh, two possibilities. One was a Matthias. And uh, he had to be, quote, 
a witness martura with us of Jesus' resurrection. The person who replaced Judas had to be a witness with us of Jesus' resurrection. In other words, they had to have seen him and known him as the risen Savior for himself. And then there's a lovely passage in 1 John chapter 1, reading from verse 1. It says, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testified. Maturomen comes from the root word martyr again. We have seen it and we testify or we are witnesses to it. So the early Christians could be Jesus' witnesses because they had seen and they had heard him and they knew him personally. That, was, that is the priority that Jesus gave to his disciples. They were to be his witnesses until he returned. So in this short passage, Jesus was saying to them, you have my power because the Spirit is going to come upon you. Secondly, you have my priority. You are to be my witnesses and, uh, up to the uttermost ends of the earth. And you must persevere in this priority until I come back. You know, there are five key days concerning Jesus. There is his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, and his return. Now, where are we living? At which point are we living right now? Jesus has been born, yes. He's been crucified, yes. He's risen from the dead. And he's ascended into heaven. Has he returned yet? No, he hasn't. So that's the fifth and remaining, the last remaining day of Jesus that's going to occur. We are living in the period between his ascension and his return. And in this interim period, we are to be about the most important task of evangelism. This is Jesus' great commission to us, and we must not neglect it. Okay, let me share with you some practical things that we can do now by way of evangelizing. How can we be witnesses today? First of all, we can live a godly life. Live a godly life. This is a very important part of being witnesses. In other words, there is credibility in what we believe. It's not just words that we are really living our lives in such a way that Jesus is truly our Saviour and Lord. So, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Last Sunday, Dr. Kelvin Chong from SBC referred to the various pillars of society, the family, religion, business, government, education, culture, and so on. God places us in different sectors of society so that we can be His witnesses. And the way in which we live our lives bears testimony to the fact that we believe in a living Lord, the true and living God. And so we live our lives in such a way that we want to please Him and honour Him. We live our lives marching to a different drumbeat from the rest of the world. We are not scampering around looking for material riches, building our own personal kingdoms or building earthly kingdoms. We are here to build the kingdom of God. And so that is our priority. And we want that to show in our lives. We want to stand for truth and integrity. We want to speak for justice and righteousness which is pleasing to God. We want to go the extra mile as Jesus taught. Put people above work. We want to encourage our colleagues, especially now during this COVID-19 pandemic with all the restrictions and all the uncertainties and anxieties. 
we want to speak about eternity because too many people are focused only on this life and all the material things that life has to offer. They are not thinking about eternity, which is a, a much longer period, isn't it? Someone once said that our lives on this earth, even if you live to 100 or 100 plus, our lives on this earth are just like a little scratch on the Great Wall of China. Just a tiny scratch on the Great Wall of China. And so eternity is a far longer and far more real uh, factor that we need to think about. And we need to keep on nudging people to think about eternity, not just the here and now. We want to be like Jesus at home and at work in our actions as well as our attitudes. So that's the first thing that I want to put to you, live a godly life. Secondly, I want to urge you to tell your salvation story, the story of your conversion. Romans 1, 16 says that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. It was the power that came into my life. It's what saved me and transformed me. And now I want to share that power with you so that you can be saved and transformed as well. I don't know about your church, but uh, in the churches that I have served in in the past, we've always encouraged our members, those who uh, want to be baptized, to write out and to share their personal testimonies especially on the day of their baptism. So a simple three paragraph uh, sheet of paper, I just write three paragraphs on a sheet of paper, which you should be able to read out in two minutes. Two minutes. First paragraph, what was your life like without Jesus? Secondly, how you actually specifically accepted Jesus into your life. And the third paragraph, what is your life now? after having accepted Jesus as your saviour. So three short, simple paragraphs. You don't want to write a 50,000 word essay. You want to write something that is brief and clear and simple so that when you share it the first time, people will hear it and people will know why it is your life was changed. You should be able to know it so well that you could shorten it or lengthen it uh, as the occasion demanded. Let's say you are riding in a lift and you are travelling up to the 20th floor and your friend is with you. You should be able to finish your three paragraph summary, uh, te testimony, salvation story before you get to the 20th floor. Yeah? So that your friend will know uh, and understand uh, and hopefully people who are in the lift around you as well will be able to hear your salvation story too. So, I want to urge you to prepare your personal testimony. But secondly, I want to also encourage you to memorize 14 life-changing words. And the 14 life-changing words are, Did you know God loves you and sent Jesus Christ to die for you? Did you know God loves you and sent Jesus Christ to die for you? 14 life-changing words which you can say to anyone but you need to memorize them. Maybe uh, afterwards you can memorize the words and, and say it to someone whom you are sitting beside as you are listening to this uh, message and going through the service. Or in your small groups, pair up with one another and uh, rehearse. Because the more you rehearse and the more familiar you are, the more confident you will be in being able to share these 14 life-changing words. I want to share with you also something which I call 4321. It's a diagram, four lines, which you see uh, on the PowerPoint. Three words that you can write in God on one side, us or me or mankind on the other, and in between, sin. Now, if you prefer another word for sin, you can write wrongdoing or evil attitudes or wrong actions, yeah? but it means the same thing. That's what separates us from God. So four lines, three words, two options. That means to say you are in two positions. There are two positions there on that drawing. We are all actually on the side that's away from God because of our sin. Two options, one saviour. Four, three, 
two, one. So four lines, three words, two options, one savior or one bridge that enables us to get across from the man's side to the God's side. And only Jesus is that savior. You can draw this on a napkin or a piece of paper very easily as you speak to your non-believing friends. Okay. Thirdly, you can proclaim God's blessings and power. Proclaim God's blessings and power. Psalm 40 verse 10 says, I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. Don't be silent. You can't really be a witness if you are just silent. You need to open your mouth and speak of God's faithfulness and salvation. When we celebrate the uh, our birthdays, for example, or our wedding anniversaries, uh, or a special event, or retirement perhaps, it's always nice not just to get together and eat, but to have a little segment where someone can share the significance of the event, especially share something uh, which is of a nature of thanksgiving share how God has blessed you personally and how he's so real to you and he's looked after you or protected you or guided you through your life in one way or another. Uh, this could be in a verbal form, this could be maybe on a card for people to take away, but however it is, give the glory to God. Yeah, all our successes, all the blessings in our lives come because God has bestowed them upon us. And so, we need to give Him the glory. Use those events to be able to share who God is to you with your friends. Be a signpost, in other words, pointing to Jesus. I used to play football in school and uh, even after leaving school, I continued to play for a while as long as uh, the old body was able to take the stress and strain. But came to a point where I realized I had to play my last football match. And so on that day, I prepared a little personal testimony uh, and I shared how grateful I was to God for the health and the fitness and the ability to play at different levels in school, for the army and so on, uh, even to travel to different countries to play um, and to make friends along the way and to just enjoy the game so much. And uh, I, I, I printed it out on an A4 sheet of paper and after the game was over, I handed it out to all my teammates so that uh, they would know my thoughts and my feelings about uh, football. It wasn't just a game, it was a true blessing from God and I wanted them to know that as well. Uh, fourthly, we can certainly give a Bible or a Gospel portion. Sometimes it's good not to give too much but just to give enough uh, to read the basics. So a portion of, of the Gospels. Mark's Gospel or Luke's Gospel um, or just the New Testament to help them to understand uh, who Jesus is because he is the focus of our faith, right? So give them enough to whet their appetite or you can give them a book to read or a tract. We do so because we believe, as in 2 Timothy 3, it says, all scripture is inspired by God and it's for useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So nowadays, you know, there are so many wonderful tracks that we can draw on. Um, this is one here, which uh, I've used over the years. These are distributed and published by the American Tract Society. Uh, and you can order them online. Uh, SKS also carries them. Uh, if you can find the right ones that you want, there's a wide, wide range of them. And so you can see two of them here. They are attractive. It's a cartoon right through. Uh, and uh, uh, the older tracks tend to be very wordy. Lots of words, right? And they tend to be small sometimes. But nowadays, people are used to pictures, something colorful. Uh, so here you give them this cartoon track. And uh, I've always been um, so thankful that when, I, when we go on holiday, I will give a track to the petrol station attendant guy and uh, I'll give it to them to read and then as I drive off I look in the rear view mirror and I can see them you know sort of reading them very intently because it's something that's attractive uh, and it holds their attention so uh, that's certainly, certainly something that we can do as well 
and then uh, we can finally prepare responses to common objections. Prepare responses to common objections. First Peter chapter three verse fifteen. It says, "Always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do so with gentleness." and respect. People have lots of questions about the Christian faith. People have a lot of questions about <clears throat> life and how the world is going and the things that we face each day. Uh, who's going to answer these questions? And I think we can anticipate some of the ones that uh, come across quite commonly. For example, how can a loving God allow suffering or COVID-19 for that matter? Is the Bible trustworthy? Uh, can we believe in miracles today? Why are there so many religions? Christians are hypocrites. What about the LGBTI movement? These are just some issues and questions that people may have as they go through life. And as Christians, we are told in Scripture that we are to be ready to give an answer, a credible answer, a biblical answer. I want to put it to you that we can be ready. We have to be ready by being prepared, otherwise we will not be able to respond adequately. So can I suggest that perhaps you take up one or two of these questions in your small groups or in your families, do a bit of research and maybe in bullet points put down how you could respond to any or some or all of these issues that I've shared with you. And maybe there are others as well which you uh, hear from your friends from time to time. Um, make it a, a, a project, put together some credible answers and be ready. Be ready to answer uh, your friends when they ask these questions. So we do all these things in order to help to bring our friends one step closer to the cross. It may be that you are the midwife spiritually that will bring the baby to birth. Maybe not. Maybe you might just be a small link in the chain, a long chain. Or you might help them with a big jump in answering some of their questions. But whatever it is, um, people come gradually to faith. And you do not know where you are on that chain, uh, where you are on that process. The thing that we must do is to do our best to help them to come one step closer to the cross. So let me summarize then this way. God's power is given so you can make witnessing or evangelism our priority. God's power is given so that we can make e witnessing or evangelism our priority, building His spiritual kingdom among all people everywhere. God's power is given us to witness. Let me close by asking you if you have come across a book by Bill Hybels called Just Walk Across the Room. Just walk across the room, Bill Hybels. And uh, in this book, Hybels says, you don't have to be any more talented, any richer, any smarter, any more or less of anything to partner with God. All you have to be is willing to be used by Him. All you have to be is willing to be used by Him. So the big question is, are you willing to be used by Him? If you have a paper bag over your head, take it off, chuck it off, throw it away, walk across the room, draw on the power of the Holy Spirit to help you to be a faithful witness for Jesus Christ today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us the Great Commission. 
we realize that it's a very important command from the Lord Jesus because it's repeated in all the four Gospels and even here in Acts chapter 1. And they are literally his last words to his disciples on earth. And so they must have been very much upon his heart as he prepared to ascend to you. So we, pr we pray, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit will help us to see past our weaknesses, our reluctance, our stubbornness, even our disobedience. And you help us, Lord, to draw on the great power that you have given to us by the Spirit. And you help us to prioritize, and you help us to persevere in the work of evangelism. Uh, especially, we pray that you will help us to speak a word to those who are elderly, perhaps our grandparents or our parents who are getting on in age and who are not yet in your kingdom. Father, help us to speak to them and to urge them to open their hearts to receive Jesus Christ as their Saviour and Lord. Give us creativity, give us courage and give us uh, confidence in you as we build and expand your kingdom. Help us to be faithful and fruitful disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.
now's the time for offering and announcements. As you prepare to give your offering and tithes to the Lord, I have two things to share with all of us for our prayerful attention. Uh, the first is, next Sunday will be the first Sunday of September and we will be observing the Lord's Supper during the service. So please prepare the cup and bread together with your family so that we can observe and partake of the Lord's Supper together during the service. Uh, the second thing is that uh, our church anniversary this year will be on 20th September, the third Sunday of September. So do uh, prayerfully consider friends that you can invite and perhaps uh, former members of CPC that you know uh, to join us for this uh, anniversary service. Now during this anniversary service, we will also be giving thanks to God for His grace and faithfulness to CBC uh, all these years. And we can give thanks to God for His goodness even uh, during this uh, period of COVID-19. So we put our hearts to join together in celebration during our church anniversary. Thank you. And let us join our hearts together as we close the service. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for giving us a message to your servant to encourage us, to challenge us to witness for you and to remind us, Lord, that the purpose of the church is to do evangelism and outreach to the lost who do not yet know Jesus as their Saviour. Father God, as we go on from here, may you empower us with the Holy Spirit so that we can become effective and bold witnesses for you. And may you continue to encourage us and remind us of the mandate you have given to the church of Jesus Christ on earth, of which we are a part. That Lord, as long as we live and exist, our mission given by you is to fulfill the great commission in our lifetime. Thank you, Lord. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship and empowerment of the Holy Spirit be with you to bless you and to keep you and your loved ones from this day until Jesus returns. Amen.